And now, um, please allow me to introduce our first panel of the day, the future of nuclear arms control and non-proliferation in the era of crumbling treaties, chaired by our great Michael Hellemann, fellow member of the consortium and director of, of non-proliferation and nuclear policy at the International Institute of Strategic Studies. Mike, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, um, Federica. That's, uh, uh, was, you were being very polite there. <laughs> <laughs> and with with your description of me, um, I appreciate that. Um, it's um, I'm in Washington D.C., so it's um, I think what three in the morning. Um, wow! Then 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 a huge thank you to you. I thought you were no, in London. So. No, no, no. It's it's fine. It just means I get to quit uh, the office real early on Wednesday morning and uh, start the Thanksgiving holidays uh, earlier. So right, I, I appreciate right. it. Um, to start, I wanted to echo something that um, Aaron had just mentioned, and that this is, uh, I, I think this is one of the more important thing uh, or events that occurs over the course of any year, and that is preparing the younger generation or the new generation of scholars, policymakers, decision makers. Um, and so I really welcome the opportunity to, have, to, to be able to chair this session. Um, and we have three great speakers, um, which I'll, or whom I will introduce um, shortly. But I, I want to thank the consortium, uh, IAI, um, and, and uh, the organizers, Federica, Federica and everyone, uh, for the opportunity um, to chair the session. Now, the title of our, our uh, session is quite clear, and I think it, everyone knows what it's pointing towards. You know. I, I've look, been looking back at arms control agreements that have, have occurred over the last uh, six, seven centuries. Um, there have been about 40 notable attempts to ban or control different types of arms. And we really haven't seen much success except uh, during the Cold War. And in fact, arms control became a central feature of, of uh, the Cold War um, where the, the mechanisms of arms control and the outcomes um, sought to slow the arms um, the, the arms race or the arms build up the number of weapons we might call it uh, quantitative arms control but they also examined the means to to um, control the, the quality of some of the weapons um, you know with the multiple independently tar uh, retargetable uh, reentry vehicles, uh, things of that nature that uh, or improvements in in accuracy. Um, so you had those two features, and I, I think it was Thomas Schelling and and some of the um, the early thinkers of during the nuclear era that described arms control as a mechanism for strengthening um, strategic stability, whether you're talking about crisis stability or arms racing stability. And then that's, that's in fact what you, you, you saw during the Cold War once the Soviet Union kind of caught up uh, in terms of the, the numbers and the quality of their weapons uh, relative to the United States. Arms control also um, provided greater predictability um, and, in, in, and as a result, some confidence between the two sides, knowing that um, if you had some mechanisms to uh, moderate or manage the behavior of your, your opposite number, um, you could have greater um, assuredness that you weren't falling behind, you, you didn't have to spend on all sorts of contingencies. And I think that's often lost as one of the... Um, <clears throat> beneficial aspects of, of arms control. Now, there was also what I call a collateral um, aspect to, to the arms control process, and that was dialogue. The strategic dialogue that was held between the, the Soviet Union and the United States was actually very important. Uh, the both, both countries were able to better understand the thought processes, the risk uh, assessments that their, their opposites were making. Um, and, and I think this contributed maybe not so much to the fact that the Cold War never went hot, but when the Soviet Union collapsed in 19, early 1990s, um, you, you saw an ability of the two sides to talk to each other. And for the for the kind of peaceful resolution to the Cold War, I think that's often um, 
overlooked by by some strategic thinkers uh, in terms of the values of arms control. Um, unfortunately, since about the turn of the century, um, we've seen the, the crumbling uh, of many of the the very fundamental aspects of the Cold War. I mean, it, start, it started with the, the, um, the United States choosing to withdraw from the anti-ballistic missile treaty, which was one, to me, one of the most important aspects of the early arms control agreements, because they tried to, one, tamp down the expansion of these defenses and, you know, the, the resulting expansions of offenses to, to overcome the defenses, it, it would really have become not only an arms race nightmare, but it would, have, it would have threatened crisis stability. And we see some aspects of that playing out today in the discussions between the, the, the Russians and, and the United States. Um, so the, the um, I guess, the evaporation of the ABM Treaty it was a, a, a kind of a beginning of what we see today in, in more vivid colors. Um, the collapse of the INF Treaty, or Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. Um, I think many of, of our younger participants weren't around during the, the height of the Cold War. Um, and the, the value of actually banning a weapons category, it was a very seminal event in the, in the Cold War. And I think it led to a lot of what happened after 1987. And unfortunately, that treaty um, is no longer in force, but um, it'll be interesting to see if there is a, um, uh, with the election of uh, Joe Biden uh, to be the president of the United States, whether there's a resumption of arms control discussions. But, you know, just this week, the U.S. withdrew from the Open Skies Treaty. Um, I'm still at a loss for, for, to explain exactly why they had made such a decision because their arguments, to, in my view, were, were quite weak. And the new start uh, um, renewal um, process uh, ground to a halt um, for a number of reasons. Missile defense is one, um, uh, but also the desire on the part of Washington to include uh, China. Uh, in those talks um, it seemed to be a real stumbling block. There were others as well. And this raises an important question. Um, bilateral agreements are very difficult to reach. Trilateral or multilateral are going to be even more difficult. And what, is, what does that say about the future of strategic arms control for nuclear weapons? Um, if the major powers don't start reducing their weaponry uh, as, as they have committed to do under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, what becomes of that? Um, we're already, you know, we've also seen the, the U.S. withdrawal from the JCPOA. Um, there was a failure to, to really go into serious negotiations with North Korea. So the proliferation of weapons is going to be first and foremost in the minds of many going forward. So with that kind of scene setter, I'd like to um, turn to the, the assigned speakers for their thoughts on this. I'm very excited to hear what they have to say. Um, you have their bios, I think, in the packets, um, but I'll give a short introduction to, um, uh, with each of the speakers as, as they come on. We'll start with Naomi. Um, she's a PhD candidate in political science at Cornell University, where she researches um, the politics of multilateral arms control, uh, nonproliferation, and disarmament. It's also the subject of her dissertation. Um, uh, Naomi is also uh, the Jan Nolan Nuclear Security Visiting Fellow at the Truman Center for National Policy. Uh, she's worked at the um, what the Council of Foreign Relations. She's published in the Nonproliferation Review. Um, and she has a uh, bachelor's from the University of California, Berkeley, go Bears. Um, sorry, I couldn't help myself. Um, and an MA from Cornell University. So with that, I want to hand the, I guess, the microphone over to Naomi. For, you know, she'll speak for about 10 minutes, um, and then she'll be followed by the other two speakers, and then we'll move to questions and answers. Thank you. Naomi? Great, thank you so much, Mike. Just one second while I get my slides going. Um, 
There we go. Can you all see my screen and can you hear me? Great. So I'm delighted to kick off this panel on the future of nuclear arms control and non-proliferation in an era of crumbling treaties. And I'm going to be a little bit provocative today and ask whether arms control and non-proliferation really is crumbling. I'll then assess what's new and different about this current moment, and looking towards the future, I'll offer a menu of options for how we can think more expansively going forward. So first, I want to question whether arms control and non-proliferation really is crumbling quite so much as we often say it is. The first point I want to make is that arms control and non-proliferation has never been easy. To take one example, the NPT, which is of course the cornerstone of the non-proliferation regime and one of our most successful agreements, the NPT took over 10 years from when it was first proposed by Ireland to when it opened for signature. And treaties are preceded by years of confidence building measures, informal dialogues and meetings upon meetings. And my interviews with negotiators from different treaties and different decades emphasize the time it took for trust to be built up. Agreements are never certain until they happen, and it's striking how much of some of the core components of treaties is agreed only at the last minute. And so we shouldn't under, um, underestimate the difficulty that past negotiators had in reaching agreements. The second point I want to emphasize is that compliance is rarely perfect. Compliance is something that is assessed, not assumed, and many agreements have mechanisms for dealing with challenges to compliance. For example, New START has the Bilateral Consultative Commission. Now, that's not to say that compliance is never a fundamental challenge to treaties and issues of non-compliance are not, but it's to say that non-compliance can, under many circumstances, be dealt with within the context of a treaty. But the third point I really want to emphasize is that pessimism towards arms control and non-proliferation is also not new. Today, many policymakers and analysts emphasize how challenging the political environment is to making progress, the lack of political will, and the need for new leadership. But if you look at writings from the 1990s, 1980s, 1970s, or 1960s, you'll see similar statements. So this quote, for example, that we are in a strange interlude of no motion on all disarmament issues, the bilateral SALT negotiations implying only contractual institutionalization of the continued arms race, and the important non-proliferation treaty becoming obsolete in its ineffectiveness. This is a quote from Alva Mernel, who was the Swedish representative to the NPT negotiations and many other negotiations, and it's a quote from 1976. And yet it's striking how similar it is to much of the discussions around arms control and non-proliferation today. To take another example, the Belfer Center Stephen Miller wrote in 1980 that the previous 25 years of arms control contain as many failures as successes, has had little impact in terms of limiting the arms race or reducing the risks of war, and is to quote, dead in the water. And I think looking back at the 1960s and 1970s, we might assess that situation slightly differently today. And so the point I want to make is that it's easy to look back and say, that things were obvious in the past, but they weren't obvious, and that many of the same challenges we find ourselves facing in arms control and non-proliferation today are perhaps not new, but are perhaps challenges because arms control and non-proliferation is hard to do. Now, that's not to say that there's nothing new or different about our current situation today. And of course, the most obvious example is treaty withdrawals, particularly by the United States. And this does pose a serious challenge, and it is more frequent than in the past. But I do also want to stress that the response from others, particularly in Europe, condemning such actions, indicates that there is still strong support for these treaties and the commitments in them. And European or states have been pressuring the US administration to return to these treaties, and we'll see what happens in the upcoming months with the U new US administration, but the Biden administration has already prioritized extending new start and returning to the JCPOA. Moreover, although withdrawal is clearly not a good thing for treaties, the effect depends on the specific circumstance. So to take a treaty that is not technically a nuclear treaty, but has been in the news quite a lot lately, if the rest of the parties to open skies continue their overflights, the effect of US withdrawal is more muted. And withdrawal does not necessarily lead to the collapse of agreements. For example, North Korea's withdrawal from the NPT did not lead to the collapse of the NPT. 
Now, changing geopolitics certainly do pose a challenge for arms control and nonproliferation. Arms control has primarily been a U.S.-Russia endeavor, and yet, as we all know, China has risen as a global power and a geostrategic competitor. Now, as we also all know, China has far fewer nuclear weapons than either Russia or the United States, and is consequently disinterested in participating in arms control. And so this situation makes arms control poorly suited to alleviate the tensions between the United States and China. And yet at the same time, these tensions inhibit cooperation between the two countries on non-proliferation. The third challenge is domestic challenges to treaty ratification, particularly in the United States. But I also want to point out that this may not be as new as it seems as well. In 1998, former arms control negotiator George Bunn was already writing about the need to pursue informal alternatives given the challenges to treaty ratification in the U.S. Senate. We see many similar recommendations today to the recommendations he was making over 20 years ago. And it's also important to assess what exactly challenges to treaty ratification prevent. So for example, extending New START does not require ratification by the US Senate. And so in this vein, it's important to think about how we can make progress on arms control and non-proliferation in ways that minimize the domestic challenges to treaty ratification. And so in this vein, looking towards the future, I want to offer a menu of options for making further progress on arms control and non-proliferation. These options offer a more expansive view than sticking to the models of the NPT or bilateral US-Russia arms control. Um, and they also involve a wider array of actors than the nuclear weapon states alone. So the first set of options concerns the form that these agreements can take. And of course, one important distinction is whether they're legally binding or not. And while legally binding agreements are often seen as the gold standard, I suggest that especially in non-proliferation, they may not necessarily be necessary. So to take one example, export control regimes do not require treaties, do not require ratification by the US Senate, and have been incredibly important in limiting the spread of nuclear weapons worldwide. Another important question is whether agreements should be bilateral or multilateral. And if they're multilateral, whether they should be open to all states or limited in membership. So for example, nuclear weapon free zones are limited by their geographic membership, whereas other initiatives like the nuclear security summits or the G8 global partnership are limited by political factors. But the point I want to stress is that rather than assuming one form should be what we are striving for, we should assess what actors and what form of agreement is most conducive to advancing non-proliferation or arms control within the specific parameters that we're searching for in an agreement. The second type of option I want to explore are the types of regulation. And here I identify four types of regulation involved in arms control and non-proliferation. Limits and prohibitions refer to limits on weapon systems, delivery vehicles, as well as behavioral limits and prohibitions referring to what systems can be deployed and in what numbers. I've already mentioned export controls, but these are a fundamental element of a non-proliferation regime. And finally, information exchanges, which receive far less attention than some of these other types of regulation, but are an essential component of any arms control or non-proliferation agreement, an essential precursor to any of these other types of regulation. The last set of options I want to explore is sources of leadership for arms control and non-proliferation. And here I want to stress the importance as we move forward for leadership from beyond nuclear weapon states. So to take one example, the TPNW has changed the debate on nuclear weapons and is an important example of an agreement not led by nuclear weapon states, but led mostly by states in the global south. Although of course, Ireland was very important as well. And I know Emily will talk more about that in just a minute. Another important example are nuclear weapon free zones, which again were largely led not by nuclear weapon states, but by states in the global south. And these are an important reminder that we have precedents for non-proliferation that didn't require leadership from nuclear weapon states. One third example is the stepping stones approach initiated by Sweden, now involving a wider array of states, which is a different model not led by nuclear weapon states. And so going forward, as we move away from models of arms control and non-proliferation that are led exclusively by nuclear weapon states, I think the states in Europe can be particularly important in bringing together nuclear and non-nuclear states to advance these goals. 
So I'll conclude just by emphasizing that arms control and non-proliferation has always been extraordinarily difficult to achieve, and that although there are certainly challenges we face today, we should not overemphasize how different some of these political challenges are from political challenges that past negotiators have faced. Moving forward, however, we need to move beyond the models of NPT and US-Russia bilateral arms control and look to a wider array of forms, types of regulations, and actors leading arms control and non-proliferation. Thanks very much, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you, Naomi. That, that was uh, a wonderful presentation. It, it raises a number of questions in my mind, which uh, we'll get to in um, uh, after uh, the next two speakers, but uh, I'm, I'm especially struck by the domestic component uh, to arms control and, and the treaty ratification elements. Uh, as you know, here in the United States, it's, it's a pretty, uh, well, um, the domestic politics is a real contact sport, as we say. Um, our next speaker is uh, Noah Mayhew, who is with the uh, VCNDNP in uh, Vienna, um, where he's a research associate focused on nuclear nonproliferation, IAEA safeguards, uh, and nuclear verification arms control in the U.S.-Russia relations. Um, he is widely published uh, at such a young age, which I find impressive. And he is also he's also contributing to some of the ongoing work at the Vienna Center uh, project on the nexus between the peaceful uses of nuclear science and technology and nuclear security. So with that, I'll hand the, the microphone over to Noah. Thanks, Mike, and hello and good morning or good evening. Uh, early morning to, to all of you as, as is appropriate. Uh, first, before I get started, I would like to thank the EU Nonproliferation and Disarmament Consortium and the, I will try my Italian here, uh, Instituto Ferie Internazionale for the invitation to speak today. Um, and particularly well done to the IAI for at least uh, the composition of this panel, if I do say so myself, uh, because as Naomi cast doubt onto whether or not um, arms control and nonproliferation is crumbling as we know it, uh, raising very fair and very important questions. I'm going to start my presentation with a very gloomy uh, picture of where we're at. Uh, I'd like to talk about what it is we can hope to do with nuclear arms control um, as the arms control architecture as we know it is in fact deteriorating in my view uh, in an unprecedented way. And Naomi, uh, Naomi outlined some of those ways. In the U.S.-Russian context, um, one can certainly point to the outgoing U.S. administration as to why this is deteriorating. But in my view, President Trump's destructive policies towards arms control and nonproliferation were really more of a symptom of the problem than the problem itself. As I see it, the, the problem we face today is the disturbing decline in the priority that powerful nations seem to put on multilateralism and on multilateral diplomacy. Um, as Mike said, I work in Vienna, home to many international organizations, including the International Atomic Energy Agency, where we've seen the so-called Vienna spirit, famous for putting compromise and cooperation above all else, decline sharply in at least the past decade. But I think the problem really dates back to the early 1990s, when the, the world order that we had grown so accustomed to during the Cold War was, was rapidly changing, was rapidly evolving. Of course, during the Cold War, we got used to a bipolar world order divided between the influence of the United States and the influence of the Soviet Union. Uh, China at this time was, of course, not the economic powerhouse that it is today. But then in the 1990s, the United States became accustomed to a unipolar world order. And, and I think in some respects, the U.S. is, is sort of stuck there, uh, if, if only in mentality. But today, we're in a multipolar world order where we don't just have to consider the interests of the US, Russia, and indeed China, but also of other powerful nations and groupings like the European Union, of course, and the Group of 77, just to name two. And I think that failing to evolve our worldview in alignment with the changing world order has led to some really faulty decision making, especially in the area of arms control and nonproliferation. We're at one time, the nuclear weapons arsenals were rapidly decreasing in numbers. We're now faced with a situation in which not only um, is arms control as we know it changing, but the only arms control treaty left standing 
uh, between the U.S. and Russia will expire in February of next year if it's not extended. And rather than recognize New START for its intrinsic value and predictability and transparency, the Trump administration has been caught in last-minute efforts to achieve an extension of the treaty on its terms rather than extending the treaty as is and immediately beginning negotiations on a follow-on treaty. Uh, now, there's a lot to unpack there, but um, you know, without diving too much further down that rabbit hole, let's talk about what can be done. First, it's my sincere hope that the new administration in the U.S. under Biden will move immediately to extend New START when he's able to do so. And I would hope he's already in consultations uh, about that with our Russian colleagues as, as he's able. Um, in this regard, I really hope that the slim margin between the U.S. inauguration on January 20th and New START's expiration on February 5th will be enough. As Naomi observed, New START does not require congressional approval for the U.S. to extend, uh, send its uh, exchange of letters to, to extend the treaty, but our Russian colleagues have indicated that the Russian Duma will need more time. I would also hope that President-elect Biden would move to start negotiations on that follow-on treaty to New START and to re-enter the Open Skies Treaty as another instrument that provides predictability and transparency, not just to the U.S. and to Russia, but also to our European colleagues. If New START is not extended, we will be left, again, for the first time since the height of the Cold War, with no U.S.-Russian arms control mechanism in force. And if this does happen, it could be taken as a sign that the nuclear powers, in particular the United States, are not interested in arms control anymore. And if this happens, other states are going to need to pick up the slack in new creative ways, and in particular, Europe would need to champion the continued implementation of the Open Skies Treaty in the absence of the United States, but also throw some significant diplomatic energy into making sure that Russia also stays in the treaty. Um, you know, all of that doom and gloom aside, I'll choose to believe that, for now, I'll choose to believe that New START, at the very least, will be extended. Uh, and given Biden's stated belief in the efficacy of multilateral diplomacy, I would also think that he would start negotiations on a follow-on treaty, uh, and the same, the same goes for Open Skies reentry. There's also a lot to unpack there, but uh, I want to touch on a, a couple of other things while I've still got time. An another divisive issue that we face in today's environment is the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the TPNW, which Naomi also touched on and Emily will talk about more extensively in a minute. It will enter into force on January 22nd of next year, two days after the U.S. inauguration. And I mention this here um, because of the unique situation that Europe faces. With the U.S. nuclear umbrella promised to protect uh, NATO countries on one hand, uh, and the EU, which is not entirely composed of NATO countries, on the other hand. Um, of the European Union's 27 member states, 22 of those states are members of NATO, and not all NATO, NATO states are members of the European Union either, which includes, of course, Turkey, that has uh, American nuclear weapons hosted on its soil. As the NPT nuclear weapon states continue to disregard, and in some cases demean, the TPNW, it's going to be very important for countries on the European continent, EU members, NATO members or not, um, where the division between the supporters and the proponents, uh, pardon me, the supporters and the opponents of the TPNW runs so deep, to continue to be vocal and conduct active dialogue with one another to prevent this divide from widening any further. Another issue that's become, um, for lack of a better term, fashionable in the non-proliferation sphere is new and emerging technologies uh, with applications to the nuclear field, another thing that Mike mentioned in his opening remarks. Each of the technologies that, that falls under this sort of umbrella term, be it cyber, lethal autonomous weapon systems, advances in biotechnology, hypersonic glide vehicles, and so on, really should be handled differently from one another, in my view. As a general point, I will add to the many voices calling for meaningful conversations on limiting the use of these technologies in, in the military sphere to start now. Um, but in the interest of time, I'll briefly touch upon the cyber issue as a matter of personal interest. Um, as many of you know, attempts to establish regulations for responsible behavior in cyberspace have been unsuccessful so far. And part of that is because, a big part of that, I should say, is because the US and Russia cannot agree on how to define cyber warfare or on what basis a conversation about this should, should have. 
And while we're unlikely to see any sort of comprehensive legally binding prohibition against the use of offensive cyber capabilities in the near future, I would really like to see a serious discussion about at least a political declaration not to use cyber capabilities against nuclear facilities and nuclear command control and communications systems. Uh, we see some parts of this debate playing out in the UN context um, right now. And I would love if such a political declaration could also include a prohibition against what I find to be the very frightening prospect of a cyber so-called left of launch operation in the, the ballistic missile defense field, which I'll be happy to comment further about during, during the Q&A. But again, in the interest of time, I can't cover the entire landscape of uh, my concerns and the political and technological challenges we face today. But I hope I've out outlined two broad points. First of all, we, all of us, need to be prepared to update our understanding of the geopolitical realities that affect non-proliferation and arms control, as well as the weight that individual states' interests have on the feasibility of reaching new arms control agreements, and indeed on the health of the non-proliferation regime at large. And second, new and emerging technologies are not a monolith. Uh, the one, of course, that causes me the most concern for the nuclear field is cyber, but hypersonic glide vehicles and lethal autonomous weapon systems carry their own set of unique challenges. So in closing, I have a few recommendations I'd like us to consider. The first one, in the, in the tech field, we need to remember the value of multi-stakeholder engagement. Especially with emerging technologies, this means meaningful engagement between the private sector, the technology developers, the civil society experts, international civil servants, government officials, military representatives, and so on. And in this vein, I could, I could dream of, if only a dream, uh, a convention on state behavior in cyberspace or something similar to that effect. And this, of course, would require the US and Russia to at least agree in talks on how to talk about cyber issues in an effective manner and in a multilateral format. Um, this certainly would not be a simple endeavor. Verification would be a nightmare. Um, but the more I see cyber evolve, the more convinced I am that developments in cyberspace with no prohibitions of even a political nature, particularly on the, the nuclear app applications that I mentioned a moment ago, is becoming very, very dangerous. Uh, second, multi-stakeholder engagement in the political sphere as well is something I'd like us to, to try and uh, promote as much as possible. And this would mean us returning to a priority placed on multilateral diplomacy um, and a reassessment going in of what each other's strategic interests really are. Uh, well, with many of these things, it'll take some creative thinking to achieve this. It's not as though we don't have any examples to draw from on this. A follow-on treaty, for example, to the New START Treaty could build on the 2010 model itself, and the negotiators could seek to, to address areas where the treaty needs to grow to, to today's conditions. And this includes new and emerging technologies and perhaps important geopolitical players like China. Uh, I know I'm just about over time, but responding to something that both Mike and Naomi pointed out, um, it, it is my strong sense that a uh, follow-on to New START should at least consider using ceilings for numbers rather than numbers and reductions. In other words, if we want China to come to the table, in addition to figuring out the transparency and verification aspect, uh, it may be much more attractive to say the, the parties to this treaty have maximum X number of nuclear weapons and Y number of basing, kinds of basing modes and, and that sort of thing, rather than reduced by X amount. But outside the US-Russia-China context, we could also seek to revive old models like the model of the nuclear security summits, also mentioned by Naomi. And if championed by a large enough country or group of countries, imagine if something like what the nuclear security summits did for nuclear security could be done for another field or even just a nuclear security summits round 2.0. Um, third and finally, in the absence of such engagement and, and such sort of tangible product progress, um, a lot of people talk about norms. For example, against the development or the deployment rather of missiles in Europe or destructive behavior in cyberspace. And some people talk about norms in a sort of um, denigrating way and others talk about norms as if they're exactly what we need to be doing. Uh, I want to point out that there's nothing contradictory between norm building and arms control at all, in my, in my view anyway. But also that 
In the absence of real progress and momentum, norms can be building blocks to legally binding treaties. And that doesn't mean that talking about norms will automatically just bring treaties into being. It means that as we talk about norms, we should focus the conversation on these tangible outcomes. And uh, the TPNW, be you a supporter or uh, not so much a supporter, is an example where exactly this happened. Um, so I'm quite sure I'm over time. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. And back to you, Mike. Noah, thank you very much. I, I think you put a lot of <clears throat> food for thought uh, on the table, and um, I, I look forward to posing some questions I have um, uh, from your presentation, uh, which I, I really, really enjoyed. Uh, next, I want to turn to Emily, forgive me if I pronounce this improperly, uh, Gadimi, is that correct? Okay. Um, even a squirrel finds the nut once in a while. Um, Emily is currently work, works at the um, Disarmament Nonproliferation Unit uh, at the Department of Foreign Affairs in Ireland, where she focuses primarily on nuclear and related issues. Um, <clears throat> she's previously worked for a number of NGOs on issues of, of political dialogue, armed conflict, and international justice, among other things. Um, she is a lawyer and uh, is admitted to the New York State Bar um, as an attorney at law. Congratulations. Um, no, I, I look, I mean, uh, Emily, I look forward to, to your presentation and I would like to hand the microphone over to you at this point. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mike, and uh, thank you again. I'll just reiterate the thanks to the organizers um, for the opportunity to join this panel um, and to share some of my own views, as um, Noah and Naomi have mentioned um, on the TPNW. Um, so just want to speak a little bit about that. And as Naomi and Noah have outlined excellently, um, there's obviously a bit of disagreement on whether we are in an era of crumbling treaties or not, but I think we're in a, a certainly a sort of challenging time. Um, but I think in this context, the TPNW has actually been an exception. It's gained rapid support um, since it was first adopted in 2017. Um, both panelists have also alluded to the criticisms and that it has very vocal critics, um, but it does have the support of the majority of states, including Ireland, um, which ratified the treaty on the 6th of August this year. Um, so I just want to touch on uh, three different issues or three, three different aspects of it today. Um, firstly, just some lessons that might be taken from the approach of the TPNW negotiations. A, a bit of an outline from my view of the context that led to the to the treaty, and then some, I would say speculation maybe, but um, some ideas about the potential um, impact of the, the imminent entry into force, including on the MPT. Um, so firstly, on the negotiations, they were particularly distinctive um, in this area for a number of reasons. There was diverse engagement from voices that aren't traditionally heard in disarmament spaces, from developing countries, from small island states, survivors of nuclear weapons testing, and from the Hibakusha. It was also notable how many women were active in the proceedings, which I, I can say is a stark contrast to what we'd usually see, although thankfully we're seeing more settings like this um, with, with a strong um, female component. Um, but the, the, the personal interventions from people who had direct experience of nuclear weapons use and testing had a really significant impact and greatly contributed to the innovative provisions that were ultimately included in the treaty. On, this, on the point of inclusivity, it's also worth noting that the negotiations were open to states and others who were opposed to the treaty, and I think it was unfortunate that many chose not to participate. Um, I see the TPNW as a tangible example of the human-centred view of nuclear disarmament really put into practice. The, it gives a vision beyond the traditional frameworks of negotiation, these are often at high political level and don't necessarily include a broader range of voices or stakeholders. 
But that said, the humanitarian view of nuclear disarmament is not new. It has its roots in the origins of the MPT. Um, it has its roots in, in, in Irish foreign policy, um, you know, very, from the early days of, of the UN, that was, um, you know, something that was, was put forward by Ireland at the time. Um, and it was very much a realisation of a concern shared by a lot of states about the real existential threat posed by nuclear weapons, posed by the proliferation of nuclear weapons to humanity and the planet. And of course, the critics of the TPNW have been very vocal about the myriad problems that it's going to pose. That it doesn't take account of the security environment, that it's not compatible with the MPT framework, or that it might actually undermine the MPT and other non-proliferation frameworks. And I think there's a number of elements within this which I just want to explore a little further. Uh, I think it's important to look at the environment that the TPNW grew from. Um, Mike, you alluded to, you know, following the, the at the end of the Cold War and in the decades following, there wasn't really much progress made on nuclear disarmament. And actually, the trend was starting to go the other way with greater modernization, increased investment in nuclear programs. And at the same time, we also saw a very concerning deterioration in the security dynamics in a lot of situations around the world, the causes of which are deeply complex, interlinked, far too detailed to, to go into in this context. But just suffice to say, there's a growing mistrust, particularly between nuclear powers, an increase in geopolitical rivalries, all of which have bled into multilateral disarmament. And Noah also mentioned this, the even the Vienna spirit that was, you know, about consensus building and all of this has, has we've seen it come under strain. Um, and we've seen this of course, in particular with the dismantling of the agreements between the two largest nuclear powers. And one obstacle I see um, in, uh, in this area is the way that competing positions seem to be presented, that they're somehow put forward as this dichotomy so on the one hand between naive and idealistic TPNW evangelists, and on the other hand, nuclear powers that are coldly indifferent to the consequences of nuclear weapons. I think this is a completely oversimplified characterization of the situation. It's not accurate. It's not an accurate description of, of e either position, really. And most importantly, it's not conducive to any progress. The supporters of the TPNW, though sometimes viewed or portrayed as being unrealistic, very much share this, the concerns about the security environment. And many states have been increasingly concerned about the growing risks of nuclear weapons use. In fact, I think the view that we could afford to wait for a more stable security environment before we can make progress is the more unrealistic one. It's precisely when we see the risks most that we have to address them. And I think Naomi also um, excellently outlined, you know, how how challenging these negotiations can often be. And it's not unusual that they're difficult conversations, um, but it doesn't mean that we can't make progress in these situations. And just to mention the, the series of conferences that led up to the TPNW on humanitarian consequences highlighted some crucial issues on this. Firstly, that the risk of an accidental or deliberate detonation was much higher than had previously been thought. And also that it would be frankly impossible to mount an adequate global response to address the aftermath of any detonation. And I think this really galvanized states to develop the TPNW to begin to address these risks. And actually, I think far from stifling progress, the discussions on humanitarian consequences and on the TPNW have actually been a catalyst for a growing number of conversations on disarmament related issues. Two that come to mind, for example, within the MPT framework, the conversations on risk reduction and verification, but I think there's quite a number of examples. And I think this has the potential now to bring states with divergent views closer together and find some common ground. Um, I'm really 
if it wasn't clear, not convinced by the argument that the TPNW is actually jeopardising disarmament efforts or increasing security risks. And I think it's, as much as it has galvanised support on one side, it's also become a convenient target for blame, where I think there's many other complex factors that have led to, to the situation that we're in. And I just want to touch briefly on the question of nuclear deterrence. And I think we need to properly interrogate the effectiveness of deterrence and to really ask what sort of security is actually derived from it. And there's a wealth of, of academic consideration of these questions that I cannot do justice to, um, but I'd note the contributions of Chatham House, Unidir and many others for their excellent work on this that I think is really essential. Um, but that said, we're not much closer to proving whether deterrence actually does what it says, and I don't think we would want to test it. Um, we don't really have any conclusive evidence that it actually functions to prevent nuclear weapons use, and I think it's starting to become more apparent that the current approach is really perpetuating the level of instability that, that we're in. But putting that aside, I also think there is a growing body of scientific and medical evidence of the impact of nuclear weapons that I think it's becoming increasingly difficult, difficult to see the logic or justify the, the enduring existence of these weapons. And actually, this was already recognised um, with the adoption of, of the MPT and in, in, in the lead up to the MPT. But it's unfortunate that the bargain struck 50 years ago still hasn't been implemented. And I think we've reached a point now where we need a meaningful reckoning with the question of whether the, the status quo is sustainable, whether it's effective, whether it's compatible with Article 6 of the MPT, or if it's actually threatening it. And I think these are questions that we need to consider when we're examining what the impact of the TPNW might be on the MPT. Um, I will just briefly say I don't really agree with the argument that the TPNW is not compatible with the MPT. It's it's mentioned in its preamble, It's the, it explicitly notes that it won't prejudice any other obligations and there's established tr treaty law that, you know, I think is, is quite kind of clear on, uh, on this. And just to say also, I mean, the other pillars of the MPT, it, it's clear from the other pillars that further legal instruments were envisaged, and I don't think Article 6 is an exception in that. Um, but what I really would like to sort of, how I'd like to see the, the, the shift in thinking is just to consider what feasible options were actually available to concerned non-nuclear weapon states who are legitimate stakeholders in the MPT, about what options were available to them in, you know, faced with the lack of progress on the implementation of Article 6. Um, and I think that, you know, that context is, is really important in, in that issue. Um, and just to sort of wrap up finally, um, there was really intense speculation in the lead up to what should have been the, the 2020 RevCon about what impact the TPNW would have. And I think there was a level of pessimism about reaching an outcome at all. We, you know, it failed in 2015 to reach any outcome. And I think there was already a sort of, oh, the TPNW is here now, we can't do anything. Um, but among the many unforeseen events that we faced this year, the entry into force of the TPNW was, was one that we hadn't expected to happen so soon. Um, and now it will be in force well, well in advance of the rescheduled RevCon. And the fact is the TPNW is now a legal reality which can't be ignored. But saying that, it also shouldn't become a distraction that dominates the RevCon. There's a lot of other issues that are within the MPT framework. The TPNW is one part of it that should be acknowledged, but it shouldn't be the entire conversation. And I really think it would be hugely beneficial for both the TPNW and the MPT frameworks for all states, regardless of their positions, to engage constructively. And um, the, you know, we will be at, uh, in the next year or so having the first meeting of state parties of the TPNW. And it's, you know, would be, I think, excellent if 
states that are, you know, maybe don't agree with it, still can participate as observers and, you know, start to engage with this as a treaty. Um, that's to say, like, the, I, I don't think the TPNW is a silver bullet, but it is an important part of the complex and, and multifaceted steps that we need to take to achieve the shared goals that we have of a safer and more secure world and one that's free of nuclear weapons. So thank you so much again um, for the opportunity to share the thoughts on that. And I really look forward to the discussion. So I'll hand back to you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Um, again, uh, excellent presentation. And, you know, there was a lot of talk about pessimism about the future. Um, <clears throat> while I am somewhat pessimistic uh, uh, about the, some, some issues related to uh, nuclear weapons um, and the control of, the, of them, um, I am very optimistic that uh, the future is, is bright given the presentations that I've heard here today. So I, I really would like to congratulate uh, all three of you. Um, we've moved now to the question and answers uh, period, and uh, I believe that you can raise a blue hand if I'm not mistaken, uh, or you can, uh, I guess, um, uh, click on your, um, what, did, what do they call it, the, the, the video, and then kind of raise your hand, and grab my attention. Um, I, I think you should pop up. Um, and. Uh, Federica, if there's a, another mechanism for them to submit questions through the chat box yes. or whatever, um, I'd happy to take them on. Um, so I ask that people don't be shy. Um, That's correct, Michael. If if um, participants want to ask questions, if they want to do it in video, they can um, raise their hand and then you can give them the floor. You will see them um, in the attendees list. You will see the raised hand there. Mm -hmm. uh, there. But they can also write questions if they don't want to appear in video in the Q&A box. So you might want to check that. I don't see any question right now, yeah. but you well, might want to check that. Too. Yeah, okay. um, I, I do have uh, some questions and um, as, as other people um, move forward, but I see that uh, I have one already. So I'm gonna read this question. Um, and if there's some time left over, we have about 15 minutes or so. Um, the Russian approach to, uh, this is from uh, Ludovica uh, Castelli. I, I think I got that right, maybe. Uh, the Russian approach to the TPNW has been changing over time from describing it as problematic and dangerous to the NPT during the negotiations up to ultimately defining it as harmless and useless. I guess there are a few open practical questions. An intriguing one involves Kazakhstan that is both a member of the TPNW and a, a Russian CSTO ally. According to the TPNW, Russia's use of the Sari Shigan test site for ballistic missile testing uh, can now be banned. The question would be if Kazakhstan will be pressured on this point and if ultimately these kind of issues will be solved bilaterally, especially when it is about countries who don't want to risk uh, complicating their relations with Moscow. Do you have any takers on this one? I can give a few uh, brief reactions. Okay. Uh, so, so first of all, on, on changing Russian attitudes towards the TPNW, um, this is weirdly satisfying that Russia has shifted from uh, a stance of the TPNW threatens the global non-proliferation regime and will lead to its downfall to a sort of, um, for lack of a better term, apathy. So I see that actually as a, as a, a positive development uh, from, from this policy standpoint. Uh, the practical question is interesting involving Kazakhstan. Uh, first of all, as I'm sure we're all aware, Kazakhstan has a long history of, of suffering from the effects of, of nuclear tests. And so despite the, the CSTO status, um, and close relationship with Russia, I, I would severely doubt that this would impact in a serious way um, Kazakhstan's uh, opposition to nuclear testing. But um, not being a scholar on the TPNW myself, if the uh, if ballistic missiles are not armed with nuclear weapons, I don't believe that's a direct violation of the TPNW on Kazakhstan's part. Um, but those, those of you who are, are more... Um, uh, 
well versed in TPNW's um, specific provisions. Um, please correct me if that is if that is not correct. But um, uh, again, despite the close relation between the two countries, I, I wouldn't expect that Kazakhstan would simply cave to to allow Russia to to conduct these tests if it would indeed be a, a, a violation of the TPNW. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, does anyone else, uh, it, it, either Naomi or Emily, want to say a word? I, I believe that um, if you do, um, I'll recognize you and that, that there is someone who, who does want to answer the question uh, live. But first to Emily. Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in quickly on, on that question as well. And just sort of, I think maybe generally on the kind of changing attitudes, I, I'm also f sort of optimistic about this. I think in, in some senses to have apathy, as Noah puts it, from a nuclear weapon state, I think is possibly the best case scenario at the moment. Um, but also, I think we are starting to see a shift in views um, in with, with some NATO states and, and with others. Um, and I think just sort of referring to, you know, going going um, to the RevCon next year, I think if we see a scenario where New Start is renewed in some form um, and there's some, you know, some stability from that, and then also this, you know, m maybe a little bit more acceptance of the TPNW, I kind of see, you know, more positive prospects um, for the RevCon. And just on the assistance point as well, I mean, it's, it remains to be seen the TPNW is not in force yet, but I would also agree with Noah's view that if, you know, if it's not involved, like the, the assistance or what, whatever the, the situation is, is not involving an actual nuclear warhead, then it doesn't, you know, I don't think it, it will ha legally be a, a violation by Kazakhstan or anyone. Um, and I think just in terms of existing um, military or, or other international partnerships, I think as long as nuclear weapons aren't actually involved, then this legally won't have any impact on that. And I think it is one of the arguments that, that's put forward that this sort of cooperation won't be possible now under the, the TPNW, and I don't think that's actually the case. Thank you, uh, Emily. It, yeah, it is, it's a difficult question, and I'm not a lawyer. Um, but uh, you know, if, if the if the missile is specifically designed to deliver nuclear weapons, um, one could make an argument that it is part of a nuclear weapon capability. Um, but that, I'll leave that to the lawyers to 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 straighten out. Um, we have a question from Manuel Herrera uh, to Naomi. Uh, do you think it is possible that in attempt to circumvent the parli parliaments and domestic representatives of states that when ratifying agreements on these matters in order to avoid the lack or absence of inclusion of states in control of disarmament agreements, the general public in these countries feel or perceive these agreements as illegitimate or undemocratic. Um, that, that's a very interesting question, and it goes to something that I, I also um, wanted to raise with, with Naomi is, is, you know, with the domestic challenges, um, as we saw with the JCPOA, um, because it wasn't ratified by the Senate, uh, the next president could come from another party can come in and just, you know, withdraw from the treaty quite easily with with little pain. Um, so I, I welcome your thoughts on on that as well as the question from um, from Mr. Herrera. Great, thank you. Um, so I think that from a question of a healthy democracy. Um, that is definitely a concern. Um, but I'll say that it, it depends on what the alternative is, right? And so if people feel that they are not being uh, uh, satisfactorily represented by their elected representatives who are supposed to um, ratify treaties, then that's a bit of a different situation. Um, so if we're assuming that people are happy with how their elected representatives are representing them, then yes, sort of going around um, and workarounds for treaty ratification does have troubling implications for um, popular accountability and popular satisfaction. Um, on the other hand, if the problem lies with domestically elected representatives um, not representing their constituents, then perhaps um, if they constituents feel that the executive making these agreements better represents them, then perhaps there's less dissatisfaction with it. Um, 
that's obviously a question that depends a lot on the particular domestic situation of a particular country. <laughs> Very diplomatically put. Um, <laughs> uh, we have uh, two other questions, one from Sybil Bauer and one from Giovanna Maletta. Um, I'm going to ask Giovanna uh, first because it ties back uh, into the question you just addressed, Naomi, uh, but I'll open it up to, to all three of you. Um, but I'm going to present both of them and the questions at the same time to, to save time and you can, uh, the speakers can chime in uh, as they wish. Um, so from Giovanna, uh, even if the Biden administration will engage again in arms control diplomacy, do you think this would be enough to restore trust in US, the U.S. ability to fulfill the agreements they participate into uh, in this field or more generally enough to restore trust in international law? Um, for example, what kind of assurances would Iran have that a future U.S. administration beyond Biden would abide by the provisions of the JCPOA? Um, I think that's a very pertinent question because in our track two, track 1.5 discussions we have with the Iranians, um, they have raised this very this issue very specifically when when people talk about Biden as a when it was a potential uh, president elect. Um, whether he would just rejoin the JCPOA, and they have some reservations along those lines. Uh, and then from Sybil, given your refreshingly optimistic, constructive uh, outlooks, what kind of nuclear arms control landscape do you think could be feasible if policymakers are similarly constructive, uh, say, in the next uh, 10 years from now? Um, so I'll start with Naomi, since um, the, the follow on question is, is kind of directed to the initial question you, you took on and then move to the other two speakers. Great. Um, so I'll take them in the order you posed them, starting with the Biden administration question and then moving to Sybil's question. I, I think this is a really good point, And I think that in the U.S. in particular, I'm often struck by conversations that say the Biden administration will rejoin the JCPOA as if it's the U.S. decision alone to make. And of course, it's up to all the parties of the JCPOA um, to let the U.S. rejoin. And I think that it's unlikely that, this is of course my own perspective, um, I think it's unlikely that Iran is going to let the U.S. join without any for immediate concessions before joining. And so I would see things like sanctions relief being a prerequisite for joining potentially. Um, in terms of more broadly, that is, that's the big question, isn't it? Um, and I am not sure how you rebuild trust um, with such a whiplash between administrations. Um, in terms of Sybil's question, um, being contrarianly optimistic again, um, I actually see room for regulating hypersonic vehicles under a follow-on to New START. Um, I think the fact that Russia has agreed to include um, its avant-garde system under New START and essentially count it as an ICBM, if I'm not mistaken, um, is encouraging and promising. Um, and I think that this offers an important precedent, and I hope that future follow-on to New START could take on issues of hypersonic vehicles. Um, I think that the similarity, although they're obviously different than ICBMs, they are more similar to ICBMs, I would say, than something like cyber or autonomous weapons are to sort of uh, things that exist al already um, that aren't new in emerging technologies. And so I think that if we're thinking about emerging technologies to be regulated, I would say that hypersonics seem to me to be the most promising to be regulated under future arms control in the next 10 years. Thank you. Um, Emily or Noah, do you have uh, points that you would like to make in, in, uh, in a follow-up to those two questions? I certainly have thoughts, but Emily, if you'd like to go first, you're more than welcome to. No, okay. Um, um, you're, you're unmuted, so let's let's go for you, with you first. So, sure. Uh, as far as the question posed by Giovanna, I, I think that Naomi uh, sort of hit the, the nail on the head. Uh, in a broader scheme, that's it's sort of a sad fact. That's the American system. Um, but having so, so to say, a new president can make the rules with things like this, put in a very sort of simplistic way. Um, the, but having said that, something I hope we all understand is that the Trump presidency, his politics aside, the Trump presidency was not normal. Um, I, I saw a report recently that that. 
advocated for many of the, the domestic U.S. systems, um, procedures, you put it that way, on, on how these things are done are based on norms that we, as on a domestic level, have never had to question before because we've never, never had Donald Trump as president. Now, that's not suggesting that um, following Joe Biden's presidency, there could not be another person such as Trump who's happy to just rip up the playbook. Um, but unless some of these procedures and in, in ratifying agreements or acceding to agreements or, or whatever um, are more concretely rooted in the U.S. system, um, that's just a reality that we're going to have to, to live with for the time being. And I agree with Naomi. Um, after such a whiplash going from someone like Donald Trump to someone like Joe Biden, uh, restoring trust is going to be difficult. And, and uh, you know, I don't have an answer for that either. Um, but, um, you, you know, I, I hope that this will serve as an example of what not to do in, in the future, uh, referring to, to Donald Trump's presidency, because, again, my personal views on the man aside, um, his, his policies and arms control were, have, have indeed been very destructive. To Sevilla's question, um, there are lots of possibilities. As I said, I think a, a follow-on treaty to New START could do a lot to address some of the concerns that people have raised in terms of uh, hypersonics, in terms of uh, perhaps other new and emerging technologies, although I agree with Naomi that hypersonics are certainly sort of easier to encompass in, a, in an arms control treaty in, in the traditional sense than perhaps other emerging and new technologies. Um, this is also the reason that I said during my presentation that I really believe that a, a better way to go about a new arms control uh, landscape would be to focus on ceilings for, for again, um, X number of um, of nuclear weapons on X number of, on Y number of delivery vehicles on Z kinds of of, uh, of basing would be a much better way to to go about it than the the classic U.S. Russian model, which has of course been just reductions. Um, and the reason I think ceilings is because it would be sidestepping the verification question and transparency, it would be much easier to motivate other nuclear-armed countries to join an arms control framework if basically it didn't ask them to do anything. Um, but <clears throat> this doesn't mean that they wouldn't be contributing to the, the landscape overall. Imagine a world where the all of the nuclear-armed, or at least the NPT nuclear weapon states, were in under an obligation to not exceed a ceiling. Well, the US and Russia will have to reduce, but probably China, France, and the United Kingdom could sit comfortably where they're at. This would be a positive motion in the non-proliferation regime. And if we don't limit it to the nuclear weapon states under the NPT, this would open the door for uh, states outside the NPT to join as well. But now I realize I'm sort of uh, dreaming here, and to, to some small extent, but, but formatting it this way might be a, a better way forward to multilateralizing the arms control framework. Um, now, verification I won't get into because that's a whole mess, but that's obviously something else that would need to be um, hammered out. And going back to my presentation, a reassessment in, in how we look at each other's interests and uh, how much we value arms control for its intrinsic uh, contribution to non-proliferation. Thank you, Noah. Um, we're about four minutes over, but we started a little bit late. Um, so I'm probably not going to be able to get to the other questions um, y y directly. Uh, but before, Emily, before you talk, I just wanted to ask, uh, kind of summarize the questions. One of them is, is about um, the modernization programs that are underway um, without getting into too much detail. Um, another question was posed, um, let me see, it was uh, um, uh, arms control treaty, uh, you know, if, or if they're truly multilateral, would they extend beyond the P5 or N5? Um, and uh, the role of big powers uh, that they play in reducing arms uh, uh, and, and how that would impact perhaps India and Pakistan. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to hand the floor to Emily. Um, you can answer any or all those questions very succinctly. Um, and if you have any other, like a summary statement that you want to make to go ahead and do that, 
And I'll do the same then for, for Naomi and, and, and Noah. So if you could limit your comments to about two or three minutes so that we don't um, delay the next session uh, and, and make the break all too short, um, I would appreciate it. So Emily? Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I, I'll keep it very short, actually, because I, I think um, there's a lot of technical expertise that Naomi and Noah have. Um, but just to, just to sort of make a general point on that sort of trust piece in, in international law and in, in multilateralism, I mean, I think the, the first question of if the Biden administration will engage in arms control diplomacy, I mean, I don't think that's an if. They've indicated that that's the direction that they want to go, and I think it's very, very positive. Um, and Indeed, like specifically on the JCPOA, I think there are certainly challenges involved in that. Um, I don't think that Iran will be, um, you know, waiting with open arms for the US to come back. But I think there, there are pathways um, to do that. And I think just ha in sort of summarizing or giving like a, a kind of a vision for what I think would be good going forward is actually, um, you know, a point that we've touched on a couple of times is is to engage states and broader stakeholders in these issues that have an impact on everybody, um, but are often just negotiated by either the two largest nuclear weapon states or, you know, the P5. Um, and I think what maybe the, the, the Trump administration has shown us is, you know, an opportunity for other stakeholders to step up into a, a leadership sort of role that like that these agreements are not entirely reliant on the political winds shifting. Um, and I think what I'd love to see in the next, you know, sort of following the next administration is that we do actually, you know, f maybe it is the EU stepping into a, a kind of a more leadership role on arms control, because a lot of these issues really do impact European security. Um, but I think to, to sort of not have these agreements really reliant on one actor, of course, it's important that the largest possessors of nuclear weapons are um, engaged in these issues, but it also affects all of us. And I think, you know, the TPNW shows that, you know, smaller states do also have a voice and are stakeholders in this. Um, and I'd like to see that kind of go forward um, as a sort of more of the norm of, of how um, how we engage in these conversations. But I think I'll leave it there because I'm sure there's other insights to be shared. But thank you so much again. Great. Thank you, Ibeli. Um, Naomi, um, we have about, well, we're, we're playing over. If you could just keep your comments to about 90 seconds or, or less, if, if that's at all possible. I hate to shortchange you, but, uh, um, you know, the, the, the time is the time. So, Naomi. Happy to do so. Um, so I'll just briefly respond to Sonia's question. Um, and I'll just say that um, certainly treaty withdrawal does set um, a negative example, um, but I'm I'm more skeptical about sort of what role the big powers, as you put it, could play to reduce the arms race between India and Pakistan. Um, you know, and and so I'm not sure that treaty withdrawal necessarily has a direct impact on that. Um, now, if there was a multilateral treaty involving India and Pakistan and um, the United States and Russia, that that might be different, um, but that's not where we are right now. Um, so I don't see too much of a impact on um, U.S. withdrawal from treaties on the relationship between India and Pakistan. Um, and then I'll just very briefly say that, unfortunately, I won't be able to attend the rest of um, the workshop as I'm in the U.S. and it's quite late. Um, but if anybody would like to chat more, I'll be checking messages on the platform. And thank you all so much for the wonderful questions. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, Noah, same to you. Um, in 90 seconds or less, I apologize for the, the, the shortness. Oh, no problem. Uh, I will briefly look at these three questions remaining in the Q&A function. Modernization, can't do much about it. Uh, Biden's not going to stop it. Trump didn't stop it. And, you know, that's just sort of where we are. Um, Prospects for European strategic stability in post-INF scenario, as I said, I'm desperately hoping that there will be some sort of um, uh, at least politically binding statement about deployment of uh, INF-type missiles in, in Europe, and I think we really need that. But European security can be uh, well-armed by Europe, as I said earlier, taking a, a much more active voice in, in multilateral uh, security affairs, which Europe is already starting to do. 
Uh, I want to mention, in addition to a conference held a couple of weeks ago by the uh, German Federal Foreign Office on Arms Control and Emerging Technologies that uh, received uh, quite high attendance, that Germany and France have established something called the Alliance for Multilateralism, which is in its infancy, infancy but I have high hopes for. Arms Control Treaty being truly multilateral, I, I hope so. Uh, but that will remain to be seen how effectively we can take each other's interests into account uh, while while having that discussion and, and what verification would, would look like. Um, I think Naomi hit the nail on the head with the India-Pakistan question. Um, I'll agree with her that withdrawing from treaties is, is not a particularly effective way to show leadership, though. Um, and finally, as Naomi said uh, about herself, I'll repeat, if anyone ever would like to get in touch with me, all of my info, email address and, and whatever is on the VCDNP website, please feel free to write to me and I'm happy to chat. <clears throat> Thank you very much to all of you for listening. Thank you, Noah. Um, I want to congratulate and thank um, all three speakers. I mean, I, I've been very, very impressed with not only your knowledge, but the conviction uh, with which you, you express it and the factual basis for, for your conclusions. Uh, I, I, I think the future is really bright when, when I look and, and see um, some of our emerging next generation specialists in, in this area. Um, I would want, and I would like to also like to thank those that pose questions from the audience, and of course to Federica, Federica for for her um, organizational skills and and getting us all online here. Um, so to end, um, I'd like to ask everyone to kind of, uh, in a virtual way, congratulate and uh, and give our uh, our speakers the the hand that they're due. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm not sure how we proceed from here, but do I head, hand it over to you, uh, Federica, Federica? Thank you very much, Mike. And thank you to all of you for the wonderful presentations. Um, yes, we will take a break now and we can reconvene at 11 sharp. So we can either close this window and then reconnect to the link or you can leave it open and you will just see the banner with the little jet music uh, <laughs> to accompany your, your break. See you later. Thank you. Thank you.